It's nice to see you all again. Um, and some new faces out there. This is, like Ingville said, this is my third year speaking at Consul. So I just want to take a moment to thank the organizers of Consul as well as all of you for inviting me back. I, I love this conference and it means a lot to me that you're getting so much value out of my presentations that you're actually inviting me back for a third year. So thank you. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Emmy Jonasson, and like Ingville said, I am the founder of the website IndieGameGirl.com, which is a free online marketing resource for indie developers that I started about three years ago, a little bit over three years ago. And its purpose is really to be a place to offer best practices and marketing tips and guidelines to help you generate more awareness for your game. Uh, and more recently, I've become the co-founder and chief marketing officer of Snow Cannon Games, a new, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a new indie publisher. Uh, we had our official launch party last night. I also see a lot of faces in the crowd who are, who are there. Um, so thank you for coming to both of our events. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about how to get press at a trade show. And before I jump into my presentation, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about how I come up with the topics for my presentation. With my blog, Indie Game Girl, and with my, my Twitter and my Facebook, I have an open invitation to indies to reach out to me if they have marketing questions or if there's a specific topic that, we, that they want me to cover in a blog post. And every year, I kind of just keep a mental tab of what themes I'm seeing in these questions and topic requests. And this year has been by far and away concentrated on press. How do I get press? How do I get press to pay attention to me? How do I get press to write articles? So I, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to talk about that today. A lot of you have spoken to me about it too, so I know that it's relevant. But because we only have an hour, I can't cover everything there is to know. And I wanted to focus specifically on trade shows because trade shows are becoming much more accessible to independent developers. It's getting cheaper to actually go to a trade show than it was before. Um, in addition, I think they're an excellent place to engage with the press. So um, with that said, when I thought about kind of how to introduce my, my lecture, I kept going back to my 2013 lecture on uh, successful indie game marketing, how to market your game on a zero dollar budget. And the first slide that I put up in that presentation was this one. Becoming a successful independent video game developer is hard. And I kept thinking, you know, that, that really sums up what it's like to get press at a trade show or an event. It's really hard. Um, but the reason that I use this same slide is more than just the fact that it kind of sums it up well. The reason why it's difficult to become a successful independent game developer is the same reason that it's difficult to get press at an event. And that is this industry, this, this market that we work in of independent games, has really boomed in the past 10 years. And because of that, there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of players, there's just a lot of developers competing for the press's attention. And whenever you get an industry or a market that has experienced such growth and such competition, discoverability always becomes an issue. And I really feel that discoverability, and I said this last night in our, in our launch, Discoverability is really now the number one issue that indies face. Um, it's kind of a hurdle for them to achieve success. And if we look at the numbers, um, it becomes very clear why this is. The slide behind me shows uh, game companies in the Nordic region, so Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, over the past five years starting with 2009. I don't have 2014 data or uh, 15, but I can say after 2013, the trend is going up. 
But in 2009, looking at these four countries, there are about 300 studios together. In 2013, that number jumped by 126% to almost 700 studios, which, which is a pretty dramatic increase uh, for just this region. And it's, it's not just this region, it's, it's globally that we're seeing the same trend. And here we're looking at studios, but if we look at games, because studios oftentimes are releasing multiple games, the picture gets even more competitive. So in 2011 here, and again, you can see up at the top what kind of platforms we're looking at, but 7th Gen, 8th Gen, Handheld, and Steam. Um, I didn't put mobile games on here, because if I did, all of a sudden all the numbers would shrink down and become super unreadable, because there are just so many mobile games being published. But if we're looking at these four platforms, back in 2011, there was about 1,600 games published. In 2013, or 2015, excuse me, uh, there were over 3,000 games, a 93% increase. And you notice the dark blue bars back here show Steam, and if we're looking at Steam alone, it was over a 500% increase in games just over the past five years. And, you know, we are seeing this trend in the industry as a whole, this problem of discoverability, but getting back to the trade shows, we're also seeing it there. Um, and if we look at PAX East, for example, in 2011, five years ago, there were 44 developers exhibiting at PAX East. In 2015, that number rose to over 140, a 236% increase. So we're, we're seeing that same problem of competition um, at the trade shows. And of course, this problem isn't just being seen by me. The trade shows are picking up on this, and different organizations are coming, and that, that want to come to the aid of indies and help with this problem of discoverability. So you start seeing things like this pop up. You know, Indie Mega Booth is trying to help, EGX Res, GDC Play. But the problem is we're still seeing this same competition sprout up there. In 2012, when Indie Mega Booth first made an appearance at PAX East, there were 16 developers exhibiting with the booth. In 2015, that number shot up to 76, a 375% increase. So looking, looking at these numbers starts to paint the picture. You know, a lot of people, you hear it said, it's super competitive, it's really tough to be successful in this market, but looking at the numbers that you really start to see just how competitive and saturated this market is. So the question really becomes, if it's so competitive and there are so many developers exhibiting at these trade shows, how do I, as an individual developer, really attract the attention of the press? And of course, there is it's easier said than done, and there's a lot of steps and work involved in this process, but if you boil it down to its essence, you need to be able to do two things better than everybody else. One, you have to be faster, and two, you've got to look better. And let me just define that a little bit in the context of trade shows. When I say you have to be faster, what I mean is that if we look at PAX East, for example, there are 148 developers exhibiting there, right? and you're just one of them. You do not want to be the last of those 148 developers emailing the press and asking for meetings. Because at that point, most likely, they're just going to be booked up and you're not, they're not going to have time for you. You want to be one of the first ones to do it. And when I say look better, I don't you know, mean dress better than everybody else. Um, what I mean is that you have to prepare your marketing assets in a way that truly drives home your unique selling points in a way that's better that, uh, than everybody else, really engages the press, attracts their attention. So they look at these things and they think that is definitely a game that I want to meet with when I'm at the show. So now let's go over actually how to do this, because it is a lot easier said than done. But there, there are four really key steps to this. And the first is, before you can even reach out to the press, you do have to generate those assets that I talked about a little bit before. Things like 
video, screenshots, press release. After that point, you can start reaching out to the press and securing these meetings ahead of time so that when you, when you go to PAX, when you go to GC, you already have a lineup of interviews. But even after you set up the meeting, that's not when your job is over. You still have a lot of work and, and oftentimes I tell Indies, in fact, I think that's oftentimes when your work really begins because your actual interview I like to think of it as more than just an interview. You really want to create an experience for a journalist or a YouTuber or a streamer. You want them to really, when they come to your booth and they talk to you, it's not just a regular interview. It is an experience. And then finally, after you actually have the interview, um, follow-up is important. So you can see that your work for securing press doesn't just end with the actual securing of the meeting. It's carried through all the way to the point when an article or a video comes out. So let's start with what press assets you need. And for those of you who have seen my 2013 lecture, um, some of this material is going to be familiar, but we're going to dive a lot deeper into it, and we're going to look at it from the perspective of uh, attracting press at a trade show. So the first thing you have is your video. And this is by far and away the most important asset you will create for the press. The reason being, other than playing your game, a video, this medium, communicates what your game is about the best. Um, so and oftentimes, you know, when a press, when a journalist is getting over 100 emails, they need some way to quickly filter the emails and decide what is interesting and what is not. And oftentimes, if there's a video link, that's what they'll just click, watch the video, won't even read the email, but watch the video. If it looks interesting, yes, I'll read it. If not, delete, put it in my trash bin. So this one, by far and large, has to be completely solid. And there are a couple of best practices here. One. No more than 90 seconds for the video. That's because after 90 seconds, the, your average viewer starts to lose their attention and may not watch your video all the way to the end. And you want them to get to the end because that's where you have your call to action. Attention-grabbing intro. You have about 10 seconds to cap capture the average viewer's attention. And within those 10 seconds, that's when the average viewer really decides whether they want to watch the rest of the video. So make sure in these 10 seconds, um, you really put uh, items in your video that count, your unique selling point. Show key strengths. Your video is a marketing asset, which means that it has a strategic purpose. And that purpose is to really show off the unique selling points of your game. You know, for example, if, you, if you're making a first-person shooter and from your target market research, you understand that people playing first-person shooters love all kinds of crazy weapons and want to see that there's a lot of um, variation in the weapon style. Make sure that you show that in your game, or uh, excuse me, in your trailer. In-game footage, um, you know, if, if you want to show cinematics and different things in your video, that's fine, but make sure that you're showing a lot of in-game footage as well because that's what the press cares about and that's what they want to see. Reviews. Sometimes if you haven't released a game, it's difficult to have reviews, but if you do have reviews from different publications, put them into your video it adds an extra layer of clout and it really piques people's attention. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's basic human psychology. If you see someone saying something really good about a game, especially if it's someone that you know, you tend to pay a little more attention to it. And then finally, always end with next steps. Never leave, never end your video with just a black screen. Always tell the viewer what to do next. You know, if your game is already published, your next step should be, go buy my game here. If it's not published, it can be something simple like, go to this URL to learn more about my game, or maybe pre-order it, or, or whatever it may be, but make sure that you always give next steps. So um, before we move over to the next press asset, I just want to show 
what I think is a really good example of a well-crafted video that, that includes all of these best practices. And this is a game called Kingdom. This was just published uh, last week on Steam, if you guys are familiar. There's the reviews right at the beginning. Here they're showing key features of the game. You can obviously see there's some kind of resource management going on. And then here you can see action. There's some kind of enemy. And then finally, where you can get the game. Next, screenshots. Up here I have an example of, um, actually this is gonna be the first game that we publish as Snow Cannon Games. Um, Mariana, I think you're there in the audience. There's Mariana from uh, Serepta Studio. The game is Shadow Puppeteer and we just came back from a conference, uh, EGX, in uh, the UK. So a lot of the examples that I use are going to be uh, from that conference um, because it's, it's relevant and they're also recent examples. So when we, when we talk about screenshots, this is definitely, this is the next most important asset. Again, it's a way to visually communicate your game. The first thing here, make sure that they're high res. Also, pay attention to composition of the screenshot. You know, these are mini pieces of art and you want people to be engaged when, you, when they look at it. So paying attention to things like the composition as well as the lighting. Um, oftentimes with screenshots that I see, they're very dark, um, especially, uh, especially games that take place in dark environments like dark forests or dark interiors. And sometimes on laptop, screens, these can be unreadable, so pay attention to things like that. Also, like we talked about with the video, show your key strengths. You know, in this example here, Shadow Puppeteer is a, is a cooperative game, and we wanted to make that clear in the screenshots. So Sarepta did a really nice job in this screenshot here showing that you have the boy and you have his shadow. They're being separated by the villain, but the, the, good, the thing that this screenshot does really well is it's showing that these are two separate characters. They're not one. If they were, the shadow would be doing the exact same thing as the boy is. And then finally, make sure that you have at least 10 screenshots um, for the press. I see a lot of developers on their press kits showing maybe three or four, and they're good, but it's just, it's not giving enough variety to the press to choose from. In addition, if the press wants to write more of a long format article, they want to have a bunch of screenshots in it to break up the text, and four just won't cut it. So try to have 10, I would say no more than 12. about EGX, what booth we're going to be at, etc. should be right there. And then finally, always include your company information and a contact uh, email address, phone number, so the press can easily get in touch with you. And then underneath the press release itself, and I didn't have enough room here, you should always have a section for your assets where you provide links to both view your assets and download your assets. And speaking of putting assets places, uh, press kit, online press kit is a great thing to have and it's a definite thing to have. Just show of hands, how many people actually have an online press kit and are using this template right here? Do press kit, okay. Okay, good. So if you're not familiar, um, you don't really have to build a, an online press kit from scratch anymore because Lambeer has already created one. It's completely free to use. It's pronounced, actually, this is pronounced Do Press Kit, but you can go online, 
search for it, download it, and just use it. And I highly suggest that everybody does. It's already set up to have space for these key pieces here, but I just listed the definites that you need to put on there. And they're things that you would expect, you know, your video, your screenshots, your um, official game description. A game page is also important. The game page has very similar information to the press kit, except it's organized in a little bit different of a way. Because the purpose of the game page is really to quickly communicate what your game is about and try to convert as many visitors to your page, to either um, fans of the game, purchasers of the game, what have you. So you can see, I put up here the example of Prune. Um, is everyone familiar here with that game, mobile title? Yeah. This, I encourage everyone to go look at this, at this page. It's done very, very well. As soon as you come on the page, you know exactly what the game is about. There are call to action buttons right at the top of where to go and get this game, followed by a video so you can watch, you can engage with the page even more and learn even more what the game is about. Further down on the page, although I don't have it here in the screenshot, are reviews about the game, screenshots, and also contact information and uh, the link to their press kit. And then finally, the last press asset that you need to have going into show is uh, social media profiles. And you can have them on whatever channels you want to have as long as you have time to maintain them. But the two that I absolutely recommend going into a show, just because they are the two that most press use, are Facebook and Twitter. And there are a couple of best practices here. And, and this is because a lot of press like to communicate now over Facebook and Twitter. So it's important to have a presence there, but it's also important to have a very targeted and professional looking presence, a presence that communicates your game in the best possible light. So first, pay attention to the descriptive texts on these pages. You know, Twitter, you have it over here to the left. On Facebook, you have it in your About section. But it should be very straightforward and short and to the point, um, describing exactly what your game is about. Next is your profile pic. And that's right up here. You can see these kind of laser beam star walls. And by the way, I, I am using Starwell here because I think they do a really good job following these best practices. Oftentimes in this profile picture, I see developers perhaps using their game logo. And it looks really nice when it's big like this. But when you start tweeting and that, that little profile picture gets even smaller, sometimes the logo is difficult to read. So I always recommend using some kind of representative image perhaps a mark, you can see what they're using up here, and move the logo instead into the cover photo, which is the one in the background. And the cover photo is actually your most important part on this page, because people that land on a social media profile page are going to look at this cover photo first. And that's an excellent place to put your call to action and really show the unique features about your game. So in the Starwall example, they have the two narwhals, or I guess star walls, fighting it off. There's kinds of, you know, all kinds of crazy facial expressions and colors, and that's very representative of what their game is about. And then right up top there, they have available on. So you know immediately where to go to get this game. And then the, the only thing that I would recommend that I'd like to see up here is I'd love to see the star wall logo up there in the cover photo. And then finally, just one other thing. Make sure before you go into an event that your page has activity on it. Um, it just, if for a journalist, you know, if you're going to communicate to them through Twitter or Facebook, it just looks a little strange and not as engaging if you haven't tweeted or posted for like two months. To just make sure that you're active and you show activity on your page. Okay, so now you have all these great press assets. Now you are ready to reach out to the press and actually start trying to set up these meetings. But first, 
you need to know who you are actually reaching out to. And when you exhibit at a trade show or an event, um, every trade show or event should send to you a press list. So who are the press that are going to be there with their contact information? Unfortunately, though, this press list often comes to you a week before the event. And by then, a lot of the press would probably have been contacted and booked for meetings. So you can't rely on that in the beginning to really start your outreach. So you have to kind of generate your own, your own press, press list. And the best way to do that is in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and think a good way to start is to think about the publications that you want to or feel like you should be featured in and just start listing them in an Excel spreadsheet. And don't forget here about smaller publications in addition to YouTubers and streamers. And then it comes down to actually finding the contact information of who to actually reach out to at these publications. And a good way to find that is by going to the publication site themselves. And typically, in the footer there, there are some links that either say staff or contact or team. And you can go there and usually find who you can reach out to with either an email or a Twitter handle. One thing I do want to point out for trade shows and events, um, most publications will send a writer who lives in the area or lives close to an area. Um, so try to, try to look for uh, if there's different regions that a publication may have. Try to pick the region that's closest to the trade show or event that you're going to. For example, I just took a screenshot here of IGN. IGN has different offices located around the world. And say if you are going to uh, an event in Australia, here you can see this is their Australian team. So make sure you pay attention to that. And once you find the contact information, put it into your, into your spreadsheet. When you're actually reaching out to the press, your email that you use to reach out to them is going to be very critical. Um, again, keep in mind that they're getting hundreds of these, so it's important to keep this email really short. This is the um, email that we actually used when we were reaching out for Shadow Puppeteer. And with this email, again, Keep in, keep in mind the time <laughs> that they have to actually read through it. You need to make sure that what you are asking for is very clearly stated in that subject line and the first paragraph, because that may be all you have time to get the writer <laughs> to read. So here we have, very simply, visit Nintendo's EGX booth for a demo of Nindy Shadow Puppeteer. So very clearly we're saying, OK, we'd really like to show you this game at the Nintendo booth. But if you're going to ask the press to do something for you, to meet with you, you have to give them a compelling reason why. So here's where you really push the unique selling points of your game. For Shadow Puppeteer, it was a couple of things. One, we're going to give you a private demo with the developers, so you'll be able to engage with them directly about the game. Two, you know, we're talking about the game, the fact that it's an award-winning title that's coming to the Wii U. And then three, Shadow Puppeteer was one of the 15 Nindies invited by Nintendo to exhibit at the Nintendo booth. And all of a sudden, with those three things combined, it becomes a more compelling of a message. And of course, you know, you can start with a template, and it's a good thing to do because it will make your outreach go faster. But make sure to customize everything to the writer or the YouTuber or the streamer that you're writing to because nothing feels worse <laughs> as a journalist than when you just get an email that is clearly a copy and pasted thing. So what I like to do before I reach out to any writer, if I know the writer, I like to add something, you know, something personal that I know about that writer to make it seem more personal. If I don't know the writer, I usually spend a good amount of time reading their most recent articles published to get a good feel for 
what angles they like to take, what subject matter they like to write on to make sure that they'd actually, one, be interested in the game, and two, so I can strike up a conversation talking about something they're interested in and relating it to how this game might be something of interest to them. So really do pay attention to that and try to customize as much as possible so that, so that you're really, when you're asking them to give you time, you're giving them the respect they, re they deserve too. And finally, copy and pay, and you'll see, this, the, you'll see this as a big theme, but make sure that you include all of your assets in this email. Links to download and view, copied and pasted right below your email. When to start your outreach. Um, Lee Petty, where are you, Lee? Are you here still? He was speaking right before me, um, and he mentioned that Headlander launched at PAX Prime. And Lynn and I were actually at PAX Prime, and we were sitting down after the launch talking to Lee, and we were just talking about how things were going. And one of the interesting things that he said to me was, he was talking about the press for the, uh, for the game, and he said, you know, we started months and months before the show actually lining up the press. And I think that's very relevant here because I, for a big show like that, as an indie, you know, Double Fine is a very well-known studio, has a great brand name, but they are still starting months before the show to actually line up their press. So it shows you just how competitive this space is and the need to start way early. For big shows like PAX Prime, I recommend that indies reach out at least three months before for press. And with smaller shows, a month before. You really can't afford to reach out a couple weeks before a show when you have studios like that with a great brand recognition reaching out months before. Reminders are super important. So you've secured some meetings at this point. You're booking them into your calendar. Now you get to the show. You want to try to avoid as much as possible cancellations or just journalists forgetting that they've set up something with you. Make sure to send out reminders the day before your meetings are with all of your press. So if the show is on a Saturday, Friday night, send out reminders to all the press that you have booked meetings with. Make sure that you use a very clear subject line that has your game in it so they don't even have to open the email if they don't want to, you know? Shadow Puppeteer, private demo, tomorrow, reminder in all caps. Within the body of the email, Again, keep it short and include just the key pieces of information so they have it right there. Where is the demo taking place? What time? What day? Who are they meeting with? And finally, make sure to provide contact information in case they need to cancel so that you have an opportunity to reschedule. All right. So you've set up your meetings. You're all set. You're ready to go. You're, at, you're getting ready to go to the trade show. Now you have to ensure that your meetings are experiences, not just meetings. And the first thing to do is make sure that the booth setup itself is super compelling. And the best way to do this is try to simulate the kind of environment that you would actually be playing this game. And I use the example of armed and gelatinous in the background because I think that this is a great example. This is a local party game, multiplayer party game. And so you would normally play this game in your living room on the couch with a bunch of friends. And I think this company does an awesome job of simulating that in their booth. They've got, kind of, I mean, it kind of looks like a, a dorm room living room. You've got the shag carpet and you've got the beanbag chairs, but that totally stands out on the GDC Play floor and it just really draws you in. Next, present your game like, like a professional. There are many opportunities in an interview to really come across um, like a professional. And Anders, I apologize. I was talking to Anders last night. I saw that big beard. I thought that was you, but that's actually another person on your team. But I, I include this example here because I think Antagonist did a great job at using their actual uniforms as another way to promote the game. A lot of journalists 
and YouTubers and streamers now actually video record their interviews. And having a uniform like this on is just another opportunity to promote the game. Um, this may seem obvious, but when you're in the thick of the moment, you can forget. When you speak to a journalist, always make sure that you speak loudly. It's very loud on the trade show floor, and it can be difficult to hear, especially if they're recording you, and most journalists do. Make sure you make eye contact with them or look at the camera. And then finally, and this is a really important one, make sure that you answer questions between journalists consistently. You want to control your message that you, that you bring across. And the best way to do this is with something called the talking points document. And this is something that you can put together beforehand. It's just all it is is a list of questions that press frequently ask. I have the top five kind of up here. Spend some time with your team going through exactly how to answer each one of these things and then memorize it. And so when the press asks you these questions, you'll be able to kind of say the same thing over and over so that when the articles come out, your message is controlled across the board. Um, just another tip on this, you can print these out and bring them to the trade shows so that you have a reference with you at all times. I do this with every single trade show I've been to with clients, and it works really, really well. After you're done with an interview, um, leave a lasting impression by giving them a memento, some sort of physical item. Uh, I include up here something by uh, Bethesda. This was, this was a while ago, but I had a client recently do something similar. This is a flash drive business card. So instead of just handing them a business card, give them a business card flash drive with all of your information, your contact info, but it also has your press assets on it so that when they go home that night and they start writing the um, article or start creating the video, they have the assets right there. They don't have to worry about the fact that they've lost your email or look you up online. You know, you have something right there for them ready to go. This is another important one. You are going to have no-shows and it sucks, and it feels terrible, but don't take it personally. It happens to everybody. But don't, don't give up on these people, because you can still, you can still turn it into something positive. Um, typically, I allow 15 minutes for um, press. If they're late, I usually send them an email saying, oh, you know, don't worry about missing this, but if, you know, do you have any other time during the show? Here's some suggested times that we're available. If for some reason they just cannot meet again at the show, um, still suggest to them something else. Okay, that's no problem. How about we do a Skype interview next week? Are you free on Tuesday? So don't feel like just because someone doesn't show up, don't give up on them. And then the final step here is the follow through. So you've done your interview, you've given them the little handout, now you want to make sure that the article actually gets created. And the best way to do that is continue having a good impression with this particular writer. Thank you notes. I cannot stress thank you notes enough. This person did a favor for you. They spent time with you. Thank you for them. Thank, thank them for it. And make sure you do it soon after, meaning the next day. Don't wait weeks and weeks and weeks. That night or the next day, spend some time writing thank you notes to everybody. And again, <laughs> you'll see this is a theme, include links to your assets because they're gonna lose them. You can also connect with social media after you send your thank you notes. Connect with the press over social media, over Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. It's a good idea to stay top of mind everywhere. Send more thank you notes. After someone writes an article about you, publishes a video, make sure you send them a thank you note, but also use it as an opportunity to present next steps. Thank you for covering my game. Next month we're gonna launch. I will send you a review code next month. And then the last thing is keep in touch. You have spent months in many cases establishing these connections, meeting with people, sending them thank you notes. Don't let that fizzle out. 
And the best way to do it is just send them a quick hello every now and then, maybe see what they're writing about, comment on it. There are all these quick little things that you can do, but it's so important to do it because you stay top of mind and you maintain the relationship because you never know when you're going to need it again. Um, and hopefully you do because your first game is successful and you go on to publish your second. And with that, thank you. Thank you.